Hello, I want to welcome everyone to our celebration of the winners of the 2020 Moment Magazine Karma Foundation Short Fiction Contest. We are delighted to welcome our contest winners and this year's judge, author Ruby Namdar, to this special literary event. It is also my pleasure to welcome literary critic and author Ruth Franklin, who will be in conversation with Ruby and Moment Editor-in-Chief Nadine Epstein about the challenges of writing Holocaust literature. Now to start the program, it is my pleasure to introduce Sharon Karmazin, an award-winning Broadway producer, a member of Moment's advisory board, and president of the Karma Foundation, which makes this contest and this event possible. Sharon? Thanks, Suzanne, and thanks for all you've done to make the contest and today a great success. When we launched this contest in the year 2000, our goal was to give unpublished writers a place where their work could receive exposure. Over the years, it has been an incredible experience to get to know these creative, talented men and women. For our contest, they have gone on to publish uh, short stories, anthologies, and novels. Their work has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Tablet, Haaretz, Plowshares, Tikkun, and many other publications. They have won prestigious fellowships and all kinds of awards. To commemorate 20 years of the contest, Momin has published a wonderful collection of some of these award-winning stories in an ebook called Good Karma. Everyone today can access that ebook free of charge just because you're on this webinar. Uh, you can go to the shop page on Moment's website and use the code KARMA, all lowercase, to access and download that wonderful book. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce the winners of the 2020 Moment Magazine Karma Foundation Short Fiction Contest. Our first place winner is Omer Friedlander, who lives in Tel Aviv, Israel, for his story, The Man Who Sold Air in the Holy Land, which really brought tears to my eyes when I read it. Our second place winner is Linda Brettler from Los Angeles, California, for her story, Private. And our third place winner is Rona Arado from Ontario, Canada, for her story, Polonaise. You can see how our contest has taken on a real international flavor. Omer's story was published in the recent summer issue of Moment Magazine. The other two will be published in upcoming issues and you certainly won't want to miss any of these stories. I guarantee they will be very pleasing to you. And I urge all you writers out there to enter the contest. This year's deadline is September 1st check our website for more information. Omer, Linda, and Rona, congratulations. I also want to congratulate Ruth Sutton of Allentown, Pennsylvania, whose story, Little Miracles, received an honorable mention. Your awards are all in the mail, and I really mean it. We are delighted to have all of our winners with us to read excerpts from their stories. It's my pleasure to invite Ruby Namdar, this year's, this year's contest judge to introduce them. Ruby? Thank you, Sharon. And thank you all. I have to say it was a very pleasurable and inspiring uh, task. And I'm very, it was a very rewarding experience. Uh, the story Polonaise uh, is a long, beautifully crafted story, bringing together the paths of a Hungarian Jewish Holocaust survivor and a young Jewish American, North American woman, bounded by their mutual love of classical music. The writer portrays with great attention to tone and detail, the mechanisms of trauma and memory that create much of modern Jewish identity. In spite of its abundance of dark, horrific moments, Polonaise remains a life-affirming work speaking of the resilience of the human spirit in face of the injustices and horrors of history. A wonderful story. Congratulations. Polonaise. At the house's street cafe where he waited on tables, 
The patrons anglicized his name from Andor to Andrew and had him repeat their orders so they could listen to his Hungarian accent. He responded to their friendly bantering with a shrug of his shoulders and a shy smile. New York was a good place for a 24 year old man in the summer of 1960. The cafe was filled with pretty girls who flirted when he served them coffee, but he was too self-conscious about his broken English and unfashionable clothes to return their attention. Back in the one room apartment he rented in an aging building off Washington Square, he brooded about his foreignness, lack of confidence, and the crippling depressions that would descend on him without warning. I've noticed Andrew several times since moving across the hall at the beginning of the school year, but we'd never spoken. Then one rainy afternoon, I was practicing Chopin's Polonaise on my piano and looked up to see him in the open doorway. He was standing very still, head tilted to one side, eyes closed. For a moment, I thought he'd come to complain about the noise, but then I realized the sense, the sense, the power of his concentration. When he realized I had stopped playing and was watching him, he straightened, nodded, and backed away. I didn't see Andrew again for several weeks. My music classes, practice for my fall recital, and my job at a Greenwich Village bookstore kept me busy, and I didn't have much time for a social life. I'd come, close to, I'd come to Manhattan from Rochester on a music scholarship, but the talent that lay so brightly in upstate New York soon paled in the stiff competition of the big city. At age 21, I was struggling to accept that I'd always be a good rather than a great musician. Three days before my recital, Andrew knocked on my door and handed me a long-stemmed red rose. But thank you for your very wonderful music, he said, in a halting, formal voice. My cheeks flamed. He smiled and his face softened from world weary man to please boy. I have not heard Chopin for many years. I looked at him. He had thick black hair that curled low on his forehead, gray eyes, about 5'10", with broad shoulders and strong arms. He wore rumpled blue pants, a baggy fisherman sweater, and scuffed leather shoes. I'm Emily Feldman. I held out my hand. He hesitated and then took it. Andrew Weiss. When I invited him in, he backed off with a muttered excuse. But several days later, I caught him listening at my door and drew him inside with promises of more music and hot coffee. As I came to know him, he puzzled me. His moods rose and fell like the tide. He spent a great deal of time alone, yet it was obvious that he craved company, so we fell into the habit of meeting in my apartment beside the piano. Always it was the same. He'd sit on my sagging sofa, lean back, close his eyes, and then drift off to another time and place. It was many months before I learned where he went on those journeys. Beautiful. The next story is private. Private is an unusual story, boldly mixing edgy magical realism with even edgier biting realism. The apparition of the dead father perplexes the reader in the best possible way and creates a dreamlike reading experience that is expertly sustained until almost the bitter sweet end. The somewhat rude awakening at the end of the story does not rob the reader of this dreamlike state of mind that lingers in the mind and keeps fertilizing, fertilizing the imagination. Amongst other themes, Private also uses the plot to discuss the complexities of Jewish memory, trauma, and survival. Great job, thank you. Private. Today, another of my usual jogs, the thousandth step of a thousandth run. Every run varied enough to include something new. It may just be a detail noticed on a familiar house, 
the tile of a fountain beyond an overgrown wall. I live in an old neighborhood and have peeked into quite a few windows through courtyards, over backyard gates, to glimpse some new and private architectural delight. Admittedly, it's not all professional interest. I find myself struggling through shrubbery to those large picture windows fronting the living room. There may be an amazing paneled ceiling or bachelor fireplace. On top of the mantle, photos of family, keepsakes and children's debris on the piano. I wonder about the illusory protection this thin pane of glass provides, separating these private lives from the outside world. After my peeking, I run on. This continuous scanning frees my mind. It is the one time of day I am empty, unguarded, and anonymous in an oversized hat and ratty t-shirt. Sometimes I think of my children. Michael, my firstborn, named to honor my father, passed away now 15 years. Or James, my new baby. And feel a joyous pain of separation, knowing they'll be mine in a half an hour. Sometimes I rechew all my mistakes at work, my failings, my anxieties, and shake them from my head as the steps continue. Today, the tree trimmers are out. They've uncovered a beautiful stained glass window. It is of a galleon above which floats a banner, in God we fear. I stray as I jog, sometimes easily gone an hour and a half or two. Andrews joked that he half expects me to er return from a run saying, you know, I never realized how red the Golden Gate Bridge really is. I turn onto Waring Street to head back. On the corner sits another average Spanish, roughly stuccoed, flat roof, mean and frugal by the standards of its day. I barely glance as I pad by the breakfast room window when I see a face staring at me, framed, frozen. The window offers no veil of privacy, nor does a sitter require it, staring expectantly at me. I keep running. It is the face of my father, my feet carry me forward, disconnected from any volition. No further meanderings or pretty buildings fog this impression. I ran straight home and told no one. It just couldn't be. Two days later, I jog again. I am the victim of both habit and a compulsion to explore. It seemed a sufficient amount of time had passed to let whatever hallucination possibly possessing my mind to pass. One thing I inherited from my father was a clear-headedness, maybe a stubbornness, favoring the rational. But I also couldn't escape his European superstitions, so I traced my path in reverse. No one appears at the breakfast room window, but as I turn the corner, I see his back to me, standing there, watering the lawn in an undershirt. He turns. I want to see my grandson. That birthright, I didn't have to ask which son he spoke of. Are you sure? He's my namesake, his temper rising. I don't know. I mean, I haven't told anyone about seeing you, not even Andrew. He steps over and turns off the water, still ho holding the hose. Wonderful. Thank you. The story, The Man Who Sold Air in the Holy Land, is a wonderfully crafted, touching story about a failed father whose only way to sustain his young daughter is by means of his overdeveloped imagination. The story resurrects the traditional diasporic Jewish character of the Luftmensch, the air person, the, whose entire existence and livelihood are suspended in the air. In a creative twist of irony, the writer chose to place that very Luftmensch in Israel, the old new homeland that was supposed to negate the uprooted diasporic existence and solve the Jewish problem by returning the Jews to the ground, culturally as well as financially. The story is distinguished by its magical, bittersweet tone, cinematic qualities, and a fine balance between humor, sorrow, and compassion. A wonderful story. Thank you. The man who sold air in the Holy Land. Simcha was the man who sold air from the Holy Land, not to be confused with those unimaginative con artists who sold oil from the oily land or water from the Dead Sea. One summer, he tried his luck selling oil. He picked enough olives from public gardens and private lawns to make a few bottles worth. 
As for selling water, he filled up bottles from the tap in the kitchen sink and added plenty of salt to make it authentic, as if it had been siphoned directly from the Dead Sea. These projects all proved too much work, too risky and too costly. Air was everywhere. He didn't need anybody's permission to bottle it. And most importantly, it was free. Like the Mediterranean Cabernet Sauvignon of the Judean Valley, Simcha's product came in boutique bottled packaging designed for the sophisticated customer with a discerning palate. He made little sticker labels for each bottle with his daughter Lali's help. On each label, she drew an old bearded man blowing a gust of wind, apparently a Greek god of some kind she studied in school. But Simcha thought he looked more like the miser, the owner of the falafel place down the street, who enjoyed quoting biblical verses from Koelet and sold half a measly pita for a small fortune. Together, Simcha and Lali polished the empty bottles with a rag, placed them side by side in a blue trolley, and went out in search of tourists willing to buy air. With his keen eye and sixth sense, a tingling sensation in the presence of the very wealthy, Simcha zeroed in on them from all the way across Dizengoff Street. Window shopping. Two middle-aged American tourists, Jewish of course, and proudly patriotic with their I Heart Israel shirts, probably with plans to marry their daughter off to an El Al pilot. Simcha got closer, innocently pulling his trolley along. Telephone. Beautiful, thank you very much. Thank you, Ruby. Before I introduce our next speakers, I want to remind everyone that you can type your questions in the Q&A box, and we will try to get to as many as possible towards the end of the program. It is now my pleasure to introduce our special guests who are going to share their thoughts about why we still write Holocaust fiction. Ruby Namdar was born and raised in Jerusalem to a family of Iranian Jewish heritage. His first book, Haviv, won the Ministry of Cultures Award for Best First Publication. His novel, The Ruined House, won the Sapir Prize, Israel's most prestigious literary award. Ruby teaches Jewish literature, focusing on biblical and Talmudic narrative. Ruth Franklin is a book critic and former editor of The New Republic. Her first biography, Shirley Jackson, A Rather Haunted Life, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography and was named a New York Times Notable Book of 2016. Her first book, A Thousand Darknesses, Lies and Truth in Holocaust Fiction, was a finalist for the Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature. Nadine Epstein is an award-winning journalist. She has been the editor-in-chief and CEO of Moment Magazine since 2004 and is the editor of Elie Wiesel, An Extraordinary Life and Legacy. A longtime writer, she has taught writing to children and adults. Nadine's forthcoming book is RBG's Brave and Brilliant Women, 33 Jewish Women to Inspire Everyone, which will re be released by Random House on September 21st. Please welcome Ruby Namdar, Ruth Franklin, and Nadine Epstein. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And those were beautiful stories. Thank you. And I hope you read all the stories so you can really get a feeling for the stories through reading them. Um, so Ruby, who's my friend and also an incredibly talented writer, we've been rereading his wonderful book here, The Ruined House. And I were, and he was our judge this year for the fiction contest. So he and I were having a Zoom and we were discussing the last finalist. I think the last five finalists um, of the stories. And um, we couldn't help but notice that really all but one of the last five was really directly about the Holocaust. Um, and we were also, even, even of these three stories that you've just heard, um, two of them are directly about the Holocaust. And one of them, I would say, which is the man in the last, the winning story, um, the man who sold air in the Holy Land, the first place story, well, even behind those curtain, the curtain of this, of the words that describe this protagonist um, is really a well of trauma that could very well be a, a story of a family whose history is connected to the Holocaust. Um, and this year, we actually went and looked at it. About 30% of the 25 semifinalists 
um, of, this, of the contest stories were on Holocaust themes. And after many years of reading all the semifinalists, I realized that, you know, there are many of the stories, a large number of the stories submitted are about the Holocaust. And this seems to be growing as years go by and not decreasing as one might expect. And I'm even actually more struck by the piles of books um, that are on our book editor, Amy E. Schwartz, her desk, which is right outside my office, where there's just piles of new fiction books. I mean, they're also memoirs, but fiction for children and adults about the Holocaust. And actually, um, they are, uh, they're not always written by Jews. They're not really only about Jews. They're written by people of all ages. And, um, and this is the fiction books. This is, does, there's still towers of memoirs that are there on the desk. So I guess there's this, I feel like there's a really important conversation to have about the relationship between the Holocaust, um, about Holocaust memoir and fiction. And I know we're gonna have that. And Ruth, who's joined us today, is really an expert on that. And I've been reading her book over the last few days that she did, which is A Thousand Darkness, Lies, and Truth and Fiction, which really gets into some of the nitty gritty of that. But I wanted to, you know, it asks things like, what is memoir? And are do memoirs need to be a little bit fiction to be good writing? And what is memory? And we're gonna have to go into some of that today. But I really want to start with the big question that's the title of this conversation, because it's the one that really intrigues me. Why are so many of us in 2021, 75 years after the liberation of Auschwitz, 85 years after Hitler came to power, why are we writing about Holocaust fiction with such furious speed? And so shortly after Ruby and I were talking about this, there appeared an article in the New York Times in the book review section by Marjorie Ingalls, who's a writer and she's the judge of another contest, the Sidney Taylor Awards. And it's for, uh, which are awards for children's books. Um, and she wrote an essay in the Times about saying really that in her opinion, there were far too many Holocaust books for children um, being written and submitted. And many of them were not good. And she felt the topic was tired to say the least. I, I think she even said maybe the word, it's, it's, a, it's a laziness that we're all talking about the Holocaust still. And I, I actually think really differently. I have a very different take on this. But before I give my take, I wanted to hear what Ruby has to say. Um, I'll start with Ruby and then with Ruth and then we'll go back to me. So Ruby, here you're a writer. And what do you think, why do you think people are writing about the Holocaust so much today? Yeah. Um, I think that there is something about the Holocaust that is the ultimate fantasy for all of us. And you know, when people think about fantasy in, in the everyday sense of the word, they think about, oh, I'm fantasizing about something I want, crave, wish I had. But the truth of fantasy is that fantasy often, maybe even more than exploring the, the nice side of your desires, fantasy actually is a way of, in which we, we explore the dark side, the fears. It's like a safe way to, to, to peek into the, the abyss of, of our fears. And the Holocaust has become and an, uh, the, the ultimate fantasy, not, not just for Jews, but for many. I mean, uh, if you think about the many and often perverse representations of the Holocaust, like just think about Tarantino's um, recent film, like Quentin Tarantino, what does he have to do with the Holocaust? But then he created this very wacky, very bold, very uh, um, edgy Holocaust fantasy of his own. So there's definitely, there's, this is, keeps drawing us because of the, of the, the horror, as, as Joseph Conrad said, the horror. For Jews, there's an extra layer, I think. And this is the fact that the Holocaust became a building block of modern Jewish identity. I think in ways, because it allows people to not do anything else Jewishly. 
it kind of became a hook on which you can hang your identity without much more commitment. It's a fait accompli. There's not much we can do about the Holocaust. It's a big scar. And therefore, if we just focus on it and turn it into the building block of our identity, we do not have to worry about how do we, what do we do Jewishly now? We already have something. Interestingly, the same thing happened. I mean, I know both Jewish American and Israeli culture well. And I have to say that the, the Holocaust serves a similar role in both cultures. It allows people to feel very Jewish, but without being religious or committed culturally. It's as if I was good enough a Jew for Hitler. That means I'm exempt. And that's maybe that laziness that Marjorie is mentioning. It's, it's easy. It's an easy out in a way. It's not a very generous interpretation, but I think there, I feel that there's a validity to it. And Ruth, what do you think? Well, I think those are both important points. And sorry, you'll still see me muting on and off because I'm a little concerned about the noise outside my windows. Um, so uh, Sorry, we don't hear anything. <laughs> good. Um, so yeah, I, I, I agree with both of the points that Rudy brought up. I'll just um, raise a couple others. You know, I think, uh, you know, the amount of Holocaust literature or, you know, the fact that the Holocaust is still feels very present in um, contemporary Jewish literature, whether American or Canadian, as we saw, or Israeli, um, you know, is a sign of the how primal, how elemental and fundamental mm -hmm. the Holocaust still feels in contemporary Jewish life. Um, you know, for a variety of reasons that we can speculate about. But, you know, I think the first one is just that, um, you know, writers of my generation, we grew up with the Holocaust in always in the background, right? I mean, it, we are like, we perhaps came from survivor families. Um, even if we didn't, you know, we will have grown up hearing survivors tell their stories uh, and, you know, I'm obviously reading their testimony um, in school and elsewhere. Um, I think, you know, for, so for us, the Holocaust, I think, has, has always been present, right? There, we don't have a concept of Jewish life in which there's no Holocaust, more than that, in which the Holocaust isn't, you know, existentially important. I think for the next generation of Jewish writers, um, they're growing up kind of with the presence of the absence. Um, they did, haven't had the same access, the same direct access, most likely, to survivors as we've had. Um, and yet there's still this, you know, kind of omnipresent sense of the importance of the Holocaust, you know, this was an event that's, uh, that was unprecedented, that is unique, not only for Jewish history and for world history. Um, so I think, you know, writers feel kind of an imperative, you know, a cultural imperative, maybe even a kind of religious imperative to uh, grapple with, you know, with this touchstone event. And, you know, you brought up also, Ruby brought up, um, or Nadine, maybe it was you, brought up the fact that a lot of this literature is written also by non-Jewish writers. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking um, of one book in particular that came out, um, I think, either last year or the year before, the graphic novel White Bird um, by the contemporary American, American children's and YA novelist, R.J. Palacio, um, who's very well known for a book that isn't Jewish at all called Wonder. Um, that's a very, very popular um, children's novel about a boy with um, a serious facial um, disfigurement and the, um, you know, the bullying that he receives as a result of that. And she sort of, she, um, RJ Palacio takes that in a different direction um, in this book called Wiper that is kind of a wonder spin-off story um, about one of the characters from that novel. Um, 
who learns his grandmother's story of um, having been a hidden child in France during the Holocaust and the way that that influences his own behavior in the present. Um, not only his bullying, but then, you know, he's, he's in fact one of the worst offenders in the bullying of this other kid. Um, but it also turns into a parable about contemporary politics in the Trump era. And I think, you know, especially obviously in the last few years, um, that's another important reason that we're seeing more and more Holocaust literature or, you know, that the, you know, the Holocaust is being invoked just as often as it always has been. Um, you know, it, it works for some writers as a kind of political shorthand um, to, you know, to warn us about um, the perceived dangers of uh, fascism and nationalism in our time. Um, and it also, I think, reflects a fear that there will be another Holocaust, you know, not a Holocaust the way that, you know, in exactly the same, you know, that would take place exactly in the same way as, um, as the Jewish Holocaust, mm -hmm. but some other kind of Holocaust that could be the result of um, racism, of, you know, of prejudice, of religious persecution. Well, I love the um, way of thinking about this, that in a way this new round of this new flood of Holocaust fiction, and again, we're even leaving memoir outside the, the, the uh, conversation here, is maybe an antidote or perceived as an anecdote to, anti, to sort of increased anti-Semitism and increased fears of fascism. I think that's a, a, that's a really interesting point. Um, I was going to say, first of all, to me, I think the Holocaust has become the, the ultimate evil. You know, there are so, so many evils that we see every day, but they're always ambiguous. What is good, what is bad for one person is different um, or can be perceived as being different. But there's very few things in the world, I would say, the Holocaust and slavery are among the things that we can all pretty much, we can all agree on are evil. Um, so writing about evil, it's hard to find something evil to write about. Evil really animates fiction. I mean, having a character or, or evil lurking in the background that explains what's happening, even if you look at the X-Men, you know, and Magneto, after they, you know, it gets later on, like in the, in the 70s, in the 90s and 2000, it gets written, he has a backstory. He's Magneto, who is the, the, the evil character in the, in the X-Men series. You know, he has a whole Holocaust background, which makes him a much more interesting character also. Um, but I think that um, for me, you know, I look at this in terms of um, the Holocaust, the trauma of the Holocaust was this human, I mean, on a, on a, in a way that we have not seen in the modern world was a human trauma that we are still struggling with. Um, when it happened, not really, most people really didn't know the details of what was going on. And then afterwards, the, the survivors didn't really speak about it. Most survivors did not even share it with their kids mm -hmm. in the beginning. It was something to be embarrassed by. Yes, and we'll talk about in a few minutes, there were a few writers who were writing about this early on, and Ruth knows a lot about those, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But the vast majority of like people in the world were not. And so for me, I feel like it took decades, like really in the 70s, people started talking about the Holocaust in a more open way. And it's taken decades now for this to really reach a larger number of people. And we are processing um, this trauma. And it's not just Jews who are processing the trauma. It's, you know, humanity. And it, among the writers in humanity, the, we, there's a need for this. And writing is a way of digesting and processing history. And I feel like in a way this is very natural. And so is it lazy? I don't know if it's lazy. I, I kind of find that, that term to be, that's assuming that we all think that, that the point of writing is great literature. So yes, we want to have great literature. <laughs> But also, I feel like the point of writing is healing and coming to terms with history. 
and we the, the this 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 whole kind of taking the imagination and people fictionalizing the Holocaust, people who had no connection to the Holocaust or had some like weaker connection or a connect, I shouldn't say weaker, but time connection through time, you know, it's um, that is not as strong as the immediate survivors um, is incredibly important. And I, I hate to judge it and say it's lazy. Um, it may be lazy for like super professional writers, but I, I think super, you know, like the writers that we consider to be the great writers. But then again, they are doing things with it that we might learn from. And it, one of the other things that I think we should talk about too, there's been many generations of Holocaust fiction. And I wanna step back a minute too. And so Ruth, maybe you could tell us a little bit about some of the first novels fiction novels, and I know we're going to wonder the problem about what is fiction and what is not fiction, <laughs> but tell us a little bit about that. Sure. I mean, you know, one thing um, that you your comments raised for me is, you know, this idea of kind of the too muchness of Holocaust literature as kind of a contemporary problem, uh, when in fact people ever, ever since Holocaust literature was first being written, people and critics, readers, the public have been complaining that there's too much of it. Um, you know, which was true, it was true for Eloise Zell, you know, as you know, when he was first trying to publish Night, um, in the late 40s and early 50s, he was running into um, people in, you know, in France where he was uh, living and writing at the time who said, we already know everything there is to know about this subject. And of course, you know, from our historical vantage point, we know how ludicrous that is. Um, you know, even now, there's no way any of us would say that we already know everything there is to know about the Holocaust. But I, you know, even as we know that, you know, many survivors didn't talk about their experiences immediately after the war. And yet, even so, there was already this perception that the Holocaust was being talked about too much. Um, so I just think, you know, um, literally, critically speaking, that's a really interesting problem. Why is somehow any, any conversation about the Holocaust kind of feels like too much? Um, and I, you know, I wonder if that's a phenomenon that we also feel in our own lives, in our own writing. You know, I certainly feel kind of a self-consciousness of always being the, I'm always the one who's bringing up the Holocaust. Maybe I'm bringing it up too much. Maybe, you know, this isn't a connection that should be made. Maybe nobody wants to hear about the Holocaust, right? Um, you know, um, but, you know, going back to your, your question, um, and indeed it's difficult to say um, which books, you know, can be, how you know how to categorize um, books about the Holocaust as fiction when in fact you know the as I as I say and as I argue in my book um, all of the major works of Holocaust testimony are characterized by the fact that they kind of blur the line between fiction and testimony um, and in fact some of them have switched genres over the years, um, for instance, Elie Wiesel's Night was originally received as an autobiographical novel, and now it's usually regarded as a memoir. Um, I think, you know, in Europe, there's less of a tendency to try to draw these strict genre lines um, than there is in the United States, for instance, where, you know, we want our memoirs to be fact checkable and you know, not to contain composite characters, for instance, that's a huge red flag in contemporary American journalism, at least. Whereas, you know, it's a it's a feature of Holocaust memoirs. And I would argue, you know, that it's a feature, not a bug, because these books were written in order to um, to draw readers in, to tell their story in the most in you know in an accessible way, in a compelling way, in a way that would bring the news of the Holocaust to the world and, um, and make it, uh, you know, make it, make it well known, make, draw readers in, um, make people, you know, despite the maybe fundamental too muchness of it all, make people want to read these books as, you know, as dreadful as their content can be. And so, you know, one of the first in that regard was Tadia Shborovsky. Um, who was writing, again, a non-Jew, although he was, of course, a, a prisoner at Auschwitz. Um, 
um, writing in, you know, the months immediately following um, his liberation, um, writing his famous short stories, including the one we know in English as This Way to the Gas, Ladies and Gentlemen, um, and publishing them in Germany uh, almost immediately after the war. Um, so, you know, I would count him among the first, you know, um, Anne Frank's Diaries published, I think already in 1947. Um, Elie Wiesel's memoir comes right after that. Um, and yeah, and so on. Well, actually, you were, one of the things we were talking about a little bit earlier is that, you know, Ellie, who didn't want to sensationalize the Holocaust and didn't want night to be made in the film, to a film, for example, but he also, he, he was a fiction writer. He wanted to be a fiction writer. And his, right after he wrote Night, which I know some people at one time considered, you know, a kind of uh, an autobiographical novel yeah. and for a variety of reasons, which I think I might not agree with, but um, I know I don't agree with. Um, I feel like um, he went right into fiction because he started telling his, he, and those books were about, really about the Holocaust. They were all, there was, was uh, Dawn and then the accident and then Beggars in Jerusalem. And these books were all about young men who were grappling with their child, what happened to them at, in, uh, at the Holocaust. Um, so he was very comfortable writing about fiction, doing fiction of the Holocaust, um, even though I, I, so I, I don't know what you think about that, um, but it seems like he preferred fiction once he, once he became established as a writer. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. Yet at the same time, you know, later in his life, he came out against fiction as a potential vehicle for writing about the Holocaust, right? I mean, he has this famous line, a novel about Auschwitz either isn't a novel or it isn't about Auschwitz. I think, you know, there is a sense that fiction can only go so far in communicating, you know, mm -hmm. the, certainly in communicating mm -hmm. the historical, historical facts about the Holocaust. So that's simply not fiction's purpose. Mm -hmm. um, fiction ha obviously has a lot of other um, potential, potential ways of communicating truth. Yeah, but so if we're talking about educating people about the Holocaust, that's not its main purpose. Well, today, I mean, we have such a passion for historic fiction. Which and for and and I have to just say that one of the books that I absolutely loved growing up as a teenager were Herman Welk's uh, *The Winds of War* and *The Winds of Remembrance*. Those books were, um, you know, I don't know whether they were critically acclaimed, but I thought they were the most amazing books, and I read every single word of them, and they were a window into history in a way that I could understand it. And the really funny thing about that, so. Uh, maybe about four years ago, my 20-something son called me and said, Mom, I'm reading the most amazing books. I, I know you've never heard about them. They're old books. I got them from my dad or my uncle. And they're called, it's called The Winds of War and War and Remembrance. And it's just so great. You should read them. And so I said, okay. And I read them. And they were just as good <laughs> the second time around. Um, and they were, again, a window for him that the same window, just coincidentally, you know, for a 20 something, you know, who was born in 1990s. Um, yeah. So Ruby, so you yeah. grew up in Israel. Yes. And so Israel, as I know you mentioned before, is has a larger proportion of Holocaust survivors than we yes. do here in the United States. Yeah. And there's a lot of, it's a whole, it's, but it is its own literary world. Yes. Um, uh, yes, some things get translated here, and yes, I know Elie Zell is translated into Hebrew, but there are a lot of things that we don't know about. So could you tell us a little bit about yes, some of the Holocaust to... fiction, not just so some much Some of the things I'm going to tell you may be very perverse, so I apologize in advance, and those of, the, of weak heart, please, like, take a coffee break, because <laughs> um, there's, um, I want to start by going a step back and Speaking about the 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 complex the complexity about dealing with the Holocaust, both in North America and in Israel, and 
some of it, most of it is around, first of all, the great sense of helplessness, as if there was something where all the agency was taken from the Jews of Europe. But then this has become even more of an issue uh, in North America and in Israel in slightly various ways. But both other Jewish centers, the small but vibrant center in then Palestine, later Israel, and the, the, the Jewish center of North America were pretty helpless and could do very little to nothing to help their brethren and sister in Europe. And this is a big, this is another layer of trauma, guilt, survivor's guilt, shame. Um, it was handled in different ways. In America, it was handled in, a, in, in, in feeling guilt. There's even a famous there's a rabbi, there's a famous text that a certain rabbi inserted into some of the machzorim, some of the Yom Kippur prayers, adding to the flagellation of the self, confessing to the sin of not having done enough. The Jews of, of North America, basically the U.S., did not feel empowered uh, or powerful enough or could not risk it or did not have the power or maybe chose not to do it. It depends on who you ask. And then felt a great sense of remorse and, and a shame. In Israel, the, the culture was so busy surviving and also building, rebuilding this new image of the Jew as, as the opposite of the diaspora Jew, as, as a kind of a full agency, full basing all your identity on self-reliance. So there were actually a very obnoxious, very obnoxious, shameful, if you ask me, way in which the Sabra culture dealt with the Holocaust, which was denial and scorn. There was a lot of scorn when, when the survivors came to, to, to Palestine and then Israel they were often met with scorn, accusations, you know, how could you go as a sheep to the slaughter, full obtuseness. So and how did that is, impact the fiction? Yeah, how did yeah. that impact the writing? And then some of the Holocaust literature in Israel actually dealt with the suffering of their survivors coming to the Jewish homeland only to be received as, as uh, uh, the unwanted guests, the, those who remind us of our shame, because it was a double shame. One is that the, the Sabra culture tried to erase the diaspora Jew from its own past, was ashamed of this, and be completely helpless to help European Jewry in any way. So this, this is, a, is a state of mind that we have to remember the complete lack of agency that both these Jewish centers had or felt vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Holocaust informs then the, the, the fantasy industry that we call fiction of how do we relate. Now, we had our own Elie Wiesel in Hebrew, a more tormented, a more a, 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 a Harrowed, I don't know if that's a word in English, like a more, a more a, a, a undone, unraveled mind. Um, and he, he always went by pseudonyms. So his, his writing name was K. Tsetnik, Katsetnik, which was a pun on, on, a, on a term from the camps. And then his, his Hebrew name was Yechiel Dinur, which was a, a Hebrewized name, which also he hid behind. He wrote very, very graphic, terrible recollections of what happened in the camps. And uh, he too had to go through a lot of um, accusations and discussion, whether he tells real stories or not. And he, I remember as a young, young person reading, we all read it. And the, the sensation was a very disturbing sensation. 
and I'm going to say something shocking now, close to pornography, because it tugged. Holocaust literature, as far as we know it, tugged on all kinds of inner guilt and shame and, and, and fascination mechanisms that were often felt inappropriate. We also were taken to Yad Vashem as children. And at that time, you know, there are two approaches to the Holocaust. One is the abstract, where you like the famous Holocaust um, a, a memorial in Berlin, this beautiful maze, but that actually is so beautiful that it really kind of covers up the horror. We grew up with a very different approach, which we were bust to Yad Vashem year after year and were shown the most horrific images, like brutal realism of what happened in the camps, like terrible. And for many of us, and now again, it's gonna be an appropriate moment, the first time we saw nudity, this was Jerusalem of the 70s, you know, it was a pretty conservative world, was in Yad Vashem. Yeah, naked people led to mass to be shot at mass graves. This is like welcome to the world of nudity. So there's a lot of strange, strange uh, um, uh, connotations that then uh, Israeli fiction uh, deals with, with this kind of a, a twistedness of the memory. Um, and to really make things perverse, I will mention that there was, at a short period of Israel, there was a, 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 a series of pornographic novels, like pulp fiction, porn, like hardcore porn, a sadomasochistic porn happening in the camps called the Lager fiction, written by young Israeli writers to like satisfy the taste of the of the public who consumed this kind of literature, in which uh, the Jews were like sexual slaves of Nazi officers. So there's such a strange, it is such a strange way of relating to the great sense of helplessness and shame that we felt having built this whole culture that we are so omnipotent and then feeling that we had zero ability to deal with the shame. And it reached, it reached the depths of the collective soul in a way that, again, as I said, erotica, the deeper, the deeper parts of the soul. So Israeli fiction definitely touches on a lot of this. And there's a lot written about the Holocaust. Some of it still speaks about what happens in the camps, but a large part of it speaks about how as children, we, we processed this terrible fantasy. One of the most famous novels that dealt with this brilliantly was See Under Love by David Grossman that, that takes this into all, like, all this, this, the weird, the weird um, semi-conscious and unconscious streams in which the Holocaust appeared in our children's minds. Uh, Grossman unearths in this novel and, uh, and there were many, many followed Grossman in opening this and speaking about the, how the trauma and how the shame seeped into our mind and, and um, a, I almost said poisoned it, but, you know, fertilized it as well with, with endless uh, potential of fantasy. So is there today in Israel a lot of, literature fiction in Hebrew about that's still digesting and processing the Holocaust and then this sort of Israeli interaction with the Holocaust that you're describing? Yes, absolutely. Maybe not quite as much as then when I was a kid, but yes, still there's a very stable presence. And again, some of it is because, again, for many Israelis, um, mostly the secular side of the, of the cultural map, the Holocaust is, remains a great like building block of secular Israeli identity. Well, while perhaps people who have more of a religious or cultural base uh, can also you know, base their identity on other parts of Jewish culture. 
but for the for those who are not steeped or very interested in in Jewish culture because it's religious or it's considered religious, mm -hmm. then the Holocaust becomes like the big bang of modern Jewish identity, which I think is is a shame. You know, it's a it's a it's a very um, it's a difficult thing to say that that an, a, a, such a vibrant a society still bases its identity on a great trauma in which we were absolutely helpless. I don't know, you know, I think a lot of Jewish identity is based on trauma after trauma after trauma Ooh. after trauma after trauma in which mm -hmm. Jews were incredibly helpless. And this happens to be the one that's closest to our time. Yeah. And I think that identity is often built on trauma, um, which is maybe not the best thing for all of us, yeah. each individual, but I don't know. I guess I, I just, I don't know. I, I love the term the big bang, by the way, um, but I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure. I think it's so human. I don't know why we should judge it and say it's a bad thing. Well, no, or, no, no, no. If I don't, I, I'm sorry if I sound judgmental. I mean, it's a fact, people base. It's just, there is, it's, it is, I feel that to bypass all the, the wonderful cultural assets that Jewishness and Judaism offer and to just base an identity on, on this deep, deep abyss, that deep like fall, free fall into, into the, the, the deep where we have no agency and there's so little meaning to be made of it really. Well, you could look at it as a portal. If this, there were many portals into Jewish identity and That's a definitely this is a one big very big. powerful portal. And, um, and once people enter that portal, many of them go on to learn other things. But let, me, let me throw the conversation back to Ruth for a minute. Um, I, would, I would also like to say, just in response to that, that I think you know, part of the intellectual problem here is that there's a gulf between the writers after the war and European Jewish intellectual culture from before mm -hmm. the war. You know, it's, it's discontinuous. We lost our connection with that world, you know, with the world of Kafka and Zweig. And, you know, it was, it was wiped out. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, in terms of another, the other, of course, animating idea of that culture was Zionism. And, you know, American, American Jewish writers, um, you know, the, the, the dream, the dream of Zionism and everything it was supposed to, to fulfill, everything it was supposed to mean for the Jewish people. And contemporary American Jewish writers tend to have, you know, a pretty uh, complicated relationship with Zionism. And so that, you know, that leaves us with the Holocaust, basically. It's a good point. And also, if you think about it, you know, there was this helplessness that would be described and that we all know about. And writing about the Holocaust in fiction, I think it might make writers feel as if they're not helpless, as if they're trying to do something. It's something that you can do. Yeah. We can't correct, we can't fix what happened, but right. we can perpetuate the story. We can warn people. We made, and I think that that to me, that's if I was going to write about the Holocaust in fiction, that's why I would be doing it, because you know it's it's it is a, writing is a way not to be helpless. Maybe uh, it is also just a way of trying to reestablish that the connection with that world, you know, mm -hmm. with Bruno Schultz and yeah. Kafka and all all those writers that. Um, contemporary Jewish writers do reach for as their forebears. And that world, as you pointed out, is, is pretty distant. Um, even, you know, it is, it's not, it is, it is distant. So um, that's a really interesting point. I was going to ask you both, and I, because I, if you each had a, and there's so many questions here I have, but if you each have one book of one Holocaust fiction book, whether it was a children's book, whether it was a book for adults, that you that was that was important to you at at any age. And, and I'm not talking about the memoirs. I mean, I you know I I walked around with Viktor Frankl's book in my pocket in grad school. 
and the little 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 copy. I, I it was just spoke to me. Um, you know, but what was there was there some book, Ruth, that that you read that meant something to you or opened the opened the portals, opened the doors for you? Yeah, I mean, it's so hard to pick one, but you know, if I'm if I'm if I'm being honest, and you know, I feel I'm a little bit reluctant to. How about three? So you don't, <laughs> so you don't have to over. Oh my God, I could go on afternoon, but I mean, the first book that comes to my mind, and the reason I'm reluctant is because it's a book by a German. Um, but it's W. G. Zabel's *The Emigrants*, um, which I when I first read it, you know, more than 20 years ago when it came out, I felt really had in some way, it felt like it had been written just for me. Um, in the path that it showed, you know, first of all, in its evocation of a narrator who was, who came, you know, belatedly to the Holocaust and, you know, to the entire, you know, tortured history of World War II. And, you know, despite his belatedness, felt that this one event had cast such a shadow on his life and, you know, was something that um, he had absolutely no choice but to reckon with and to try to reach, uh, you know, to try to, to reach a kind of understanding of and a way of, um, of relating to it and incorporating it into his a contemporary life. And I think, you know, I'm also so affected by the form and the genre of that book, which again, um, is a book that kind of straddles genres and inhabits, inhabits a space deliberately in between genres and is fictional in important ways. Um, but I think it's equally important that it's based on reconstructing the lives of um, for actual real people. Um, again, it, it does it in a fictional way, um, incorporating, you know, a lot of techniques from fiction. But I think it was important to Zabald that um, his portraits were, were based on fact and were based on real people because they, he saw them, I believe, as a way, he used the word restitution, but as a way of trying to, to make amends in a way to reanimate um, the lives that were, that were either lost due to events that happened in the war, otherwise kind of drastically altered by them. And I think, you know, that's a real metaphor for contemporary Jewish life and that our, our lives have been drastically affected by the Holocaust in ways that, you know, in some ways we are still only beginning to understand. Mm -hmm. Can you just mention, repeat the name of the author for everybody? Yeah, it's W.G. Zabel. And he's the, he was a German writer who lived in England for much of his life, uh, but wrote in German. And, and the book is called The Emigrants. And if you had to pick in one other book briefly, what would that book be? My so, goodness, I mean. <laughs> I, just, I wanted to make it easy for you so you didn't only have to like, you know. Um, you know, and I think in terms of the, um, what we think of more conventionally as Holocaust fiction, um, one of the books that's most important to me is Imre Karatej's Fatelessness, um, which is his book about his kind of fictionalized memoir or autobiographical novel um, about his experiences in, in the camps. Um, and again, he really kind of explores the possibilities for fiction um, as a way, a, you know, as a way, a legitimate way of talking about the Holocaust. Kertesz said that, you know, even though he was a survivor, he felt that for his novel, he had to create the world of the camps um, in a way that was comprehensible in fiction, you know, that was internally coherent. Um, and that, you know, it wasn't, I think, implicitly, he's trying to avoid the quote unquote laziness that we've spoken of. Um, and I think, Part of when when we have that response to works of Holocaust literature, um, I think it's because um, those works aren't kind of fully reimagining the Holocaust, almost as if it were a fictional event, but are using a kind of shorthand, an imaginative shorthand, that assumes a kind of um, you know assumes a certain amount of knowledge on the part of the reader, um, you know assumes that we are kind of following the author on the path that they're taking when in fact, you know, um, just the fact of setting 
a novel in the historical setting of Auschwitz or you know elsewhere um, doesn't guarantee that it will you know be credible, that it will feel realistic um, or believable to the reader of fiction. It has to it has to also work as a work of fiction. That's great. If you're looking for great literature, good literature, yes, that's a great point. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you, Ruby. What do you, what do you think? Do you have oh, a book that spoke to you as a uh, young person or as an adult? Yeah, I again, I read so many, and as Ruth said, it's so uh, there's so many to and, and so many ways of in conflicting ways. I did mention the very harrowing work of Kertetnik, who wrote a, a brutal hyper realism of the camps life. And I read it as a young person, and it was very formative to me. Um, and then th the other pole of it was David Grossman's intellectual, a, a, a beautifully crafted, but in a way I felt that he was already beginning to coat it with the beauty of the work. And that sensation was very formative for me to see it on one hand how well, he captured the, the sensations of a young boy trying to process uh, the Holocaust or what he called the Nazi beast, which in his mind, which was a cliche used in the Hebrew kind of word of, word of letters, the Nazi beast. And he's like turning it into a real beast in his, dim he's like feeding a beast in the basement. And at the same time, and I was very young when I read it, I already felt that there's, he's beginning to build the beautiful scar tissue over the wound, which Katsetnik would never allow to heal. So this was a very interesting uh, sensation, reading these two authors and seeing how one tries to keep the wound open and bleeding while the other is beginning to, to cover it. And the third writer, which is not as well known, but I think had the, one of the most amazing effects on me, and I, I read it so many years ago, and I remember so much of it, is a lesser known writer. I don't know if it was even translated to English. I was just like trying to see if I, I couldn't find. Uh, a Slovak, Czechoslovakia at that time, a writer named Ladislav Grossman, who wrote a collections of short stories, very sensitive, with a very thin brush, describing the last moment of normal life before everything, everything was obliterated. Wow. And that, and he he touches on the denial, on the little on the little moment of a young woman who's who wanted very much to get married and she was getting old and then suddenly she finds the, the, right, the right person and she's so excited about her wedding, but this is exactly where everybody is supposed to start being rounded up and be taken. But she doesn't see it because for her, this is the wedding she was waiting for all her life and by God, she's going to be a beautiful bride in her wedding. And what made it so poignant for me and I, cannot let go of this, is that there's not a single horrific moment. Nobody's murdered, nobody's butchered. At the same time, you walk, you, you walk through the text feeling that your muscles are clenching more and more because the horror is hanging so low above the last moment of seeming normal, normal life. And that was perhaps the, the one that I would say eventually that's the book that I think made the most effect, most impact on me. I think what we're going to do is we'll make a list of all these books that have been mentioned today and we're going to send them to all of you and to me too, because I want to read them. And we're talking about a lot of books that are not part of the normal conversation today. Mm -hmm. Um, I just want to, can I name one other one also? Because yes, I realized I didn't do can. all three. Um, there's another, and um, speaking of books that aren't usually part of the conversation, um, there's a book I really love um, by a French-Polish author named Piotr Rawicz, 
um, called Blood from the Sky in English translation. Uh, I also write about this in A Thousand Darknesses. Um, and one thing, what fascinates me so much about this book is that it really uh, kind of goes against the grain of um, the imperative that so many of these writers seem to have felt to write in a testimonial way and to, you know, to, to be witnesses even as they're writing fiction. And Ravitch just um, kind of totally rejects that. And his book is, his book, it's an ugly book, you know, written, narrated by, um, a, you know, a, a man who presents himself um, kind of as a surrealist poet. It takes place, the, the, it, it's framed by um, a man telling his story in Paris, I think in the 1960s. It's been a little while since I read it, so I'm a little fuzzy on the details. Um, but he's a survivor who doesn't hide the ugly things that he did um, during the war to survive. You know, he tells lies, he deceives people. Um, there's a place where he may even have raped a woman. Um, and I think, you know, I would just add that to what Ruby was saying before about the way survivors were perceived, especially in Israel after the wars there, uh, you know, it's, we don't, we don't like to remember this, but, um, you know, many people wondered what exactly they had done in order to survive. There's an assumption that um, they must be criminals if they had, if they had managed to make it through the camps. Uh, as, as Primo Levi, I think, wrote, you know, the best all died, it was only the worst who survived. And Ravitch's book really, um, you know, kind of plays with that idea. But the, I think what's so radical and revolutionary about it is the way that it explicitly presents itself as kind of an anti-testimonial novel. He says, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not gonna tell you what happened to me. I'm not gonna tell you it in a reliable way. Um, you know, I'm going to present it in this very kind of hallucinatory, dreamlike way. And, you know, if you're looking for history, for fact, um, you shouldn't be looking for it here. This isn't, this isn't what my, my way of, of narrating is about at all. Thank you. Wow. We only have a couple, a couple minutes before I want to open this to questions. And there are a lot of really interesting questions, I see. Um, but I was wondering, let's take this back to today, because today is when we're seeing that people are still writing about the Holocaust, 85 years after Hitler came into, you know, took over in Germany. Um, is there something more recent, Ruby, that comes to mind that's a fiction about the Holocaust that you think is, has done a good job, whether it's in Israel or here, whether it's for children, whether it's for adults, you know, it's, I don't have like a recommendation if that's what you're seeking, but I am still, I am amazed at how much still it's in the conversation. But I can't say that something right now comes to mind that I think everybody, you must read. I'm, I'm very curious to hear what Ruth has to say. And also it's the, just by the way, it's in the background of a lot of stories too. It's oh, like, yeah. it's not always the overt theme. It's just lurking there in a lot of, I certainly in a lot of the stories that come out that come to our fiction contest. Yes. Uh, Ruth, what, would you have a thought on that? Well, I did read a beautiful novel. Um, you know, again, it feels so weird to use the word beautiful in this, um, under these circumstances, but I do think this novel was beautiful. Um, a book called, that didn't get a lot of attention, um, called Mischling by a young, um, writer named Affinity Konar um, that I reviewed for the Times a few years ago. And it fictionalizes, um, you know, lightly fictionalizes um, the stories of um, some of the children, um, the twins who Dr. Mengele experimented on. So it takes, you know, really this, this darkest, one of the darkest, most horrible aspects um, of Holocaust history and writes about it again in almost a kind of a fairy tale um, parable kind of way in this very kind of dreamlike style that um, reminds you of course that um, a lot of the most gruesome stories that we know are fairy tales you know they have, happen to be fairy tales from Germany of all places and so you know that's not mm -hmm. that's not as crazy a choice as it might sound like. 
Um, but, you know, I also wanted to mention another novel. I read a lot of um, Jewish books for children as a parent, um, looking, I was looking for this, this stuff. And, um, you know, to Marjorie Ingalls complaint that, um, that children's literature, Jewish children's literature, especially is just saturated with the Holocaust. You know, as a parent, I do really feel that as, as an issue and a problem because that's not what I want my children to grow up knowing about Jewish life. You know, obviously it's inescapable, <laughs> um, but I, want, I also want their literature to represent the other aspects of Jewish life. And so I recently read a book, again, I think this one's a few years old, um, called The Hired Girl by a writer named Laura Amy Schlitz. And um, it's narrated from the perspective of a non-Jewish girl um, who goes to work as a servant in the home of a Jewish family um, in like turn of the century Baltimore. And the way she learns about their customs, I, this book, and I'm just gonna say this book has nothing whatsoever to do with the Holocaust. <laughs> and it stood out to me because um, it might have been the first time, or at least the first time in a long time, that I read a work of young adult Jewish fiction that wasn't about Jewish tragedy. And it, you know, it in fact depicts this Jewish family, you know, they have their problems and all that, but it depicts them and you know, just the fact of being Jewish in, you know, dare I say, a very positive way. And I, you know, reading this book did kind of bring home to me the lack of, of, of such positive depictions in, especially, you know, in American Jewish fiction for kids and for young adults. And I, I think that is, you know, that's, that's a shame, you know, we need the Holocaust fiction. It's, you know, I'm not, I'm not belittling its importance. Um, I, you know, I'm not downplaying, um, the, you know, the gravity of the role that it plays in American Jewish life. But I also think we need to be able to show children, especially that there's a lot more to Jewish life than the Holocaust. And uh, thank you. That's really great. Thank you. And I want to just say that I, I, I still find that no matter what you're reading, even when it's not about the Holocaust, that often like the, the condensation from the Holocaust that's still settled on the pages somehow mm -hmm. because we're reading it. We're reading these books with the knowledge of the Holocaust yeah. and we read into like, I, you know, on some level, even in Omer story that we just, the, the first place story, although he never ever mentions the Holocaust. I found that I, 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 and he can also, I'll ask him again, <laughs> but I found that I read some of it into it. Um, in the, tr in, in the, you know, the trauma of the character. So anyways, there's so much here to explore. We've only, there's so many questions to explore here and we've only had a few minutes to do this. And I just want to thank Ruby and thank you also Ruth, both of you for exploring them with us today. And I want to hand this over to Suzanne who has I can see many, many, many questions, <laughs> and we wanted to have a few minutes for uh, the audience to, to ask questions. Yes, thank, thank you, Ruby, Ruth, and Nadine for that wonderful conversation. Uh, um, we'll get to a couple of questions. I'm, I'm sorry I won't be able to get to all of them. Uh, the first question is, do you have any concerns that the amount of Holocaust fiction gives support to the Holocaust deniers' claims that the Holocaust is all fiction? It's a great uh, question. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the Holocaust deniers are so sophisticated as to make that very clever argument here. Oh, fiction, this is fiction. But um, I do feel that the, 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 it does add to a, to a sense of saturation that at some time people say, okay, enough with this. Holocaust business, and that's what, like somebody said before, I think Nadine, that every, every oh, maybe it was you, Ruth, every mention of the Holocaust seemed too much. So there is definitely too muchness, as Ruth said before. That maybe could be the... 
I think there's been a long, long theme of Holocaust literature, memoir, even being accused of being fiction. I, I, I think that this is not a new thing at all. I think that, um, you know, Ellie Wiesel had to live mm -hmm. this conversation. Primo Levi, so many of the writers um, had their stories taken into question by people who, who some of them who might've been Holocaust deniers. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I disagree a little bit, but I don't know, Ruth, what do you think? Yeah, I, I do actually disagree with, with the premise of the question, really. I don't think it's up to literature to prove the facticity of the Holocaust. Um, that's just simply not the purpose of literature. That's not, that's not its responsibility. Um, you know, that's the, um, that's the arena of historians. And I think at this point, you know, thankfully, at least in America and the Western world, the facticity of the Holocaust is not up for debate. Um, obviously, there are there are parts of the world, unfortunately, where that's true. Yeah. Um, and introducing a few Holocaust novels is, you know, not going to make a difference there, one way or the other. I think, you know, I think the what is unfortunate is, you know, there are, you know, there there are some there are many, you know, books and fiction about the Holocaust. There's a huge spectrum from, you know, the very, very imaginative to the very close to the historical truth. Um, and especially when we're talking about fiction for children, a lot of these books take pains to show kind of where they fall on that spectrum. And I think, you know, I don't, I, there, there are a few books that are very, very popular that I think do run the risk of presenting a distorted view of how the Holocaust actually took place. Um, and I think, you know, we've, we have that problem with Holocaust film as well. And the, you know, the popularity and the prevalence of the yes. Holocaust film. I, you know, I had the experience of um, being told by, um, you know, a number of years ago when Schindler's List came out, um, uh, being told by um, um, people in Poland that uh, Schindler's List made the Holocaust look worse than it actually was. <laughs> and, um, you know, so the, uh, I, I think the issue with some of these books is, a, is not that it makes the Holocaust look worse, but that, you know, it, it doesn't depict it in the kind of, you know, in with detail and historical context, and that there is a danger that students who are particularly younger students who come to these books um, maybe without a particularly educated instructor who's able to give them that context, may be in danger of developing mistaken impressions. Thank you. Uh, somebody else wanted to know if you were at all concerned that because there's so much Holocaust fiction and popular memoirs being published, that the Holocaust is the only aspect of Jewish history and Jewish people that many non-Jewish readers in America are being exposed to? Yes, <laughs> that's my short answer. <laughs> I agree <Yeah>. with you. <laughs> okay, great. And, then um, and that's why I brought up actually the book um, by Laura Amy Schliss that I brought up a few minutes ago, because yeah, I do think, I think it's great when, uh, you know, I think there are books out there, again, especially for children, like they're the all of a kind family books, but, um, so many of us were brought up on that again, do depict a kind of Jewish life. But it seems like that actually that's the only way for contemporary American writers to depict a Jewish life separate from the Holocaust is to depict it historically before the Holocaust actually took place. Um, again, I think perhaps because we see contemporary American Jewish life as being so affected by the Holocaust that it simply can't be written out. Mm -hmm. So I also think it's a safe, like, you know, one of the, there's different conflicts in Jewish life today. I mean, there are books about intermarriage for kids and for adults. There are books about Israel, but in a way, the Holocaust may seem safer. <laughs> you know? That's interesting. <laughs> you know, what, another thing I'd bring up actually is the TV show Shtisel, um, which is so mm -hmm. popular among American Jews also among non-Jews, um, and again, is a, is, doesn't, doesn't depict the Holocaust, is a show about contemporary um, ultra-Orthodox life in Israel. 
And maybe that's one reason for that show's great popularity is that it does depict a vision of Jewish life that doesn't include the Holocaust. Thank you. I do think there's a fascination in fiction with orthodoxy. Yeah, that's it. Whether it's historic yeah. or whether it's modern um, from, you know, Chaim Potok, from, you know, memoirs, fiction coming out today about, there's just so much of that, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, see, a, um, oh, go ahead, Ruby. I'm sorry, what Ruth, um, uh, what Ruth said about Stiesel, um, is I think it's, it's very interesting, and it reminds me of another very popular Israeli series called Fauda, which is about, you know, the, the, uh, special forces that are working in the West Bank under under guise and of Palestinian, and this this for me is actually all about the Holocaust because I think it's so there's such an overreaction to the to turn the take the Jew from the camps and then to create these rough ragged Israelis that I'm from Israel and I know they exist but this is not. It's amazing to like make them the face of Israel. That it, it, for me, it feels like a huge overreaction. It's like, let's take that, that image of the Jew in Auschwitz and then let's go to the absolute other end and create this like cave people that are all action and all violence. I said, no, this is who we are as Jews today. So there actually, I do see the presence of the Holocaust in a very kind of, uh, the ghost of the Holocaust, if you will. Fascinating. So it's all about the Holocaust, even when it isn't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. That we see the condensation of the Holocaust. It's the, the rain, the drops, the rain has fallen on everything. And even on the Orthodox, if you think about it too, because so many of the Orthodox, the, the, the tr you know, truly Orthodox Jews were, were the ones who were, who were murdered. Mm. And We've recreated, this is like, a, orthodoxy has been recreated for a modern time in a variety of ways. So even that fascination with the orthodox in fiction of film or whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, novels, is, could be seen as, uh, as a reflection, yes. Mm -hmm. So maybe it all comes down to Holocaust fiction. Uh, as, as we as we begin to wrap up, um, someone made a comment that uh, you all may want to comment on as well. I think when it comes to the idea of too much Holocaust literature, some people are uncomfortable with the conversation, just like there are Americans today who say we talk too much about race. I think the too much issue speaks more to people's insecurities, threats to their beliefs, and threats to how they see themselves in the world. How can we really have too much written about any traumatic historical event? Do we say that we have too many stories dealing with the Civil War or the Revolutionary War? You know, sure, I, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, do you, go ahead. Say so you, you think so, go ahead. No, I think that's actually, what, that's exactly what was going on, you know, when Ali Wiesel was being told that there was already, that everybody already knew everything there was to know about, about the Holocaust in, you know, in 1952. Um, you know, this idea that, you know, especially in Europe, that, you know, we need to pick up and move on, uh, that there's no, no use in, it's also politically very expedient, right? Because um, mm -hmm. um, there are many things that maybe that didn't, people did not want to have um, exposed about um, conduct yeah. during World War II and exactly what took place um, in, you know, in the occupied countries. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's another, definitely another issue. I think that the that that the hit like right now like the Holocaust is an incredibly rich trove for writers, and for Jewish writers and non-Jewish writers. But I would say the same thing is happening in terms of race, and in terms of slavery and reimaginings of slavery, and just from so many different perspectives, and of Jim Crow and of the legacy of slavery, that that is. Because again, it was such a trauma, uh, a trauma that has gone on for a very long time, a different kind of trauma, but a trauma that has just lasted for a few centuries in our country, that it's as, it's as rich a topic. Yeah, and yeah. also a trauma that is unresolved, right? And I think you made yeah. that point earlier that you know, as, as writers, we're writing um, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to kind of work through the Holocaust and process it and, you know, get beyond it. And I think 
part of what we need to understand is that there isn't going to be any resolution. There's no way to process the Holocaust in a way that's going to feel emotionally satisfying or, you know, probably literarily satisfying. It's, you know, it's, it's simply not possible. Well, I think for individual writers, maybe going through the process of writing helps you to grapple with it. Uh, sure. helps the writer to grapple mm -hmm. with it, which is one reason brings us back to why so many people are writing about the Holocaust, but why so many people are writing about deep trauma of any kind. Mm -hmm. but, did you want to give your, the last thoughts uh, before we conclude? Well, Ruth, but Ruby, wanted, did you want to answer that question? And this could be my last thought as well, is that when I say too much, and you know, we all use the too much in various ways, some ironic, and um, I think that there is a there is a problem if if an entire identity is based on on one trauma, and that as as uh, as Ruth said so well, that erases uh, other sides of uh, so many other aspects of Jewish life that are so rich, so inspiring. And that there is something about maybe a convention that was established that if you're going to write Jewish work, it must deal with the Holocaust. And maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. For sure, there's a convention. And I would be happy to see more and more Jewish cultural products that don't feel the necessity to always go through Auschwitz. There are many Jewish roads. They don't all lead to Auschwitz, I hope. Okay, thank you. And on that note, we do need to conclude. I'm sorry we could not get to more questions. Uh, thank you, Ruby, Ruth, and Nadine for that wonderful conversation. You've all given us a lot to think about. I also want to thank and congratulate our three winners of the 2020 Moment Magazine Karma Foundation Short Fiction Contest, Omer, Linda, and Rona. Congratulations. And a special thank you to Sharon Karmazin, Dina Elkins, and the Karma Foundation for their support of this short fiction contest. We definitely could not do this without you. I also want to remind everyone to visit the shop page on Moment's website at momentmag.com, where you can download the ebook Good Karma, which is a collection of some of the stories that have won in the past. Just use the special code Karma to receive a free copy of this ebook. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email. We'll include the link in the code, as well as links to both Ruby and Ruth's websites, as well as Nadine's forthcoming book. And we'll also include a list of all the books that everybody suggested here today. Again, thank you to our winners, special guests, and to all of you for joining us. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.